Talk and Rock Radio, where friends meet at the intersection of life, inspiration, and music. Here's your host, Rick Kern. performances in 19 countries during a unique career that spans over 30 years, Michael Peterson has had the good fortune to be a million-selling Grammy-nominated country music star whose songs have hit number one on the charts 13 times, including the fourth most popular country wedding song of all time, From Here to Eternity, and the iconic Drink, Swear, Steal, and Lie. A songwriter for the stars with the unusual good fortune to have had his compositions recorded by Hall of Famers and Grammy winners in country, rock, pop, gospel, and Latin, including Travis Tritt, Timothy B. Schmidt of the Eagles, pop superstar Denise Williams, The Imperials, and Basilos. Musical director for the number one show in Branson, Missouri, Raiding the Country Vault. A contributing author for eight books, including his latest, Little Is Good, and the New York Times best-selling Chicken Soup for the Soul series. The recipient of numerous distinguished public service awards, including the prestigious Bob Hope Spirit of Hope Medal from the USO, following his 11 tours and over 150 performances for servicemen and women deployed to Iraq, Afghanistan, and South Korea. Michael's most recent CD, Drink, Swear, Steal, and Lie, commemorates his 20th year in country music and has been particularly successful in Europe, giving Michael a nearly unprecedented four consecutive number one hits on the European Country Music Top 40 in 2018 alone. He and his wife, Army Women's Hall of Fame inductee, Colonel Jill W. Chambers, U.S. Army retired, currently live in Las Vegas, have three daughters, and a dream life. From here to From Las Vegas, Nevada, welcome Michael Peterson. Hey, man. How are you? Fine. How are you, man? I'm doing great. It's really good to have you on board with us today. And I have to thank our dear friend, Stephen McClintock, for making this happen, man. Well, Stephen's a great guy, and I really appreciate when he called me and told me that he had a great time with you. He asked me if I wanted to do it, and I thought, yeah, why not? Let's go. Yeah. So here we are. Well, it's cool, you know, and I... uh after looking at all of your stuff, Michael, I am so impressed with you and all of the things that you've accomplished in the last 30 plus years. It's, it's amazing. It really is. And I think what I'd like to do is um, jump in this thing with you telling us a little bit about, well, first of all, you're from Tucson, Arizona. We yeah. know that. And I wanted to uh, have you talk a little bit about how you got going in the music industry where at what point in your life did you realize that this is what you wanted to do for a for a living you know i remember um sitting i was in my i was probably 21 or 22 and uh i was sitting in the living room of the apartment that i was renting with uh, my best friend looking through the uh help wanted ads uh, to see if I could find a job because I needed a job uh, as most 22 year olds probably do. So, uh, you know, I'd been driving pizzas uh, uh, to people's houses for uh, Domino's for a while. And uh, I had worked some for the parks department there in, in uh, Renton or in Redmond, Washington. And I just remember sitting there looking at all of these, you know, ads for help wanted um you know I, my background was psychology that's what i went to college for but um uh, you know i left about six months prior to graduating so i didn't have my degree and an, a bachelor's degree in psychology is some on some levels pretty much worthless unless you're trying to get a master's so i just i just you know struggling like see so many people do at that age and I just remember having the strongest feeling that there was nothing in the paper that was going to be there for me. And there was nothing 
anything that was ever going to be in the paper that was going to be a job that I would want for a lifetime. And, and, you know, I spent all my free time with a guitar in my hand and a pen in my other hand. And I was writing 25 songs a year, you know, whether my friends liked them or not, you know, and I just was consumed with it. It was something that was really important to me. So at that point, it was just a dream. Like, could I ever make a living as a songwriter? Could I ever have hit records? Like that ever even be possible? I just knew that that, that was the only thing I was deeply and profoundly interested. In. And, you know, it's worth noting that that was 40 some years ago. And the feeling is as strong today as it was then, and it has never wavered. So I, I think that that's probably a good indication that I'm in a, I'm in the right lane anyway. Well, there's no doubt about that, you know, and I got to tell you, you and I have identical similarities here because from 69 to 72, I went to college here at the University of Texas at El Paso. And yeah. what do you think I got my degree in? Uh, psychology. Yeah. And it's a BA. Uh, and right. right after that, I loaded up my van, put everything that we had in storage, and we went on the road for five and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So, right. We have that in common. I mean, you know, um, there's, a, there's a song that I wrote uh, once called, What Should I Do With My Life? And the chorus says, should I turn left or turn right? Move on from here or sit tight. There's only one way to tell. So you might just as well take a chance on your dreams and roll the dice because that's where the answer lies. What should I do with my life? Nice. And that, that really sums up what for me has, has been the driving gamble. The gamble that, I, that I've taken really all along this journey through adulthood and professional career was take a chance on your dreams. I mean, I knew, I, you know, there was, there was never a shortage of jobs available in the newspaper, even if there were jobs I didn't want to do. And I thought, if it doesn't work out, I can always go grab one of those until I figure out a way to get back in the lane. So I just kept taking a chance on my dreams. In the process of your music development, Michael, did you, did you pretty much just get out there and expose yourself with agents and playing the, the bars and clubs and stuff? No, no, I had, a very non, I had a very non-traditional, I mean, if you think about the way that, uh, I think I haven't ever had a deep conversation with many people about this. So some of the things I'm about to say are assumptions, but, but I see a lot of young people that, you know, they create a, a game plan for getting in the music business. And it pretty much is summarized by what you just said. You know, you, you get in a band or you, you know, find places to play and you try to go do that. So I had friends that I knew that were in the music business in Seattle where I was living at the time in the, in the uh, you know, mid to late eighties. And the ones that were chasing the music business were, you know, they were playing in cover bands and on Friday night and Saturday night, they'd be at Waldo's, you know, tavern there in, in Redmond playing, or they'd be at Parker's, you know, in Seattle. Um, and, you know, they were having fun and I think they were making some money but they weren't playing original music, you know? And, and most of the people that I knew that were trying to play original music were big time struggling to make it. I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to uh, wonder how I was going to pay my rent every month, you know? So um, in my, probably around the age of 22 or 23, I stumbled into a church one day called East Side Foursquare Church. And long story short is within a year, they offered me an internship uh, in their music department. And within a year of that, they offered me a full-time job. So uh, I ended up for the first several years of my you know, professional career as a you know, sort of post-college, after I finished with you know, whatever pickup jobs that I had gone through to get to that place, I ended up as a staff member at this church for a couple of years. And I was coaching football and, and uh, basketball and track at a local high school. And I was a, a you know, part-time on to being full-time worship leader and staff songwriter. And uh, the pastor of this church was a really innovative guy. He was way ahead of his time. Seems sort of normal now for 
churches to have staff songwriters. But this would have been, you know, 1984, 85. And he had staff songwriters. And so I found myself in a place where I was in front of an audience two to three times a week, you know, singing and interacting with an audience. And it was church music, yes, but the dynamics of being with an audience and understanding how to communicate. And then the, the people I had around me were really good. But I had mentors. And I, you know, I just, being, I was being paid to write songs. Now, they were church songs, but I was being paid to exercise that muscle. And we would make recordings. And we would, so, so for, for a period of, you know, almost 20 years, I was in that culture on some level. I, I, I was there full time for a while. Then I went away for a couple of years and then I came back and I was away and then I came back. But I was in a relationship with this culture there where I was paid to write songs. Uh, I was making a decent living. I wasn't worried about where I was going to get my money from. Um, I had the freedom to go play other things that weren't church related. You know, if I wanted to try to find a, a coffee house to play in or, you know, uh, a club that I might go for, uh, for an open mic night or something like that. You know, um, I had a lot of friends that were, you know, making music, creating music, arranging music. And, uh, you know, kind of in the middle of that first turn at the church, um, I ended up leaving the church uh, to take a job in Spokane, Washington, with a group of guys that were going to be traveling, doing school assemblies for high school students. And this involved uh, feats of strength, as kind of a hook to get kids' attention. We do crazy stuff, you know, blow up hot water bottles till they explode, break bricks with your head, this crazy stuff like that. But the whole idea was to get kids' attention and then to be able to speak uh, positive values into their lives. So, you know, what does that have to do with the music business? Well, I found myself essentially on the road 250 days a year or more doing performances all the time in front of audiences. And I thought to myself, well, you know, occasionally they would have me sing and i thought well what if i made a record like maybe i if i had an album maybe i could sell that album you know at these performances so i you know i borrowed some money from my father-in-law and i i went and made this record for five thousand dollars you know and the guy that produced it was a guy that was my my college football quarterback because he oh, wow. was the only guy he was the only guy i knew in the music business right so we made this record together and about a year and a half after we made the record together um, he started dating the pop star, Denise Williams. Wow. So uh, they ended up getting married. And in the process of all of that, you know, they got to know each other. And she had asked him, well, what do you know about the music business? He said, well, I produced a record. Well, what did you produce? Well, I produced this record for my friend, Michael Peterson. So she heard the record. She really liked it. They formed a little production company called Gateway, uh, Gateway Music House. And at that time, she had just was on the heels of having Let's Hear It For The Boy, which was the number one, the biggest song in the world at the time. And she was just on the heels of that. And she formed a production company and uh, designed to help her get a gospel music deal. So they formed a production company, a publishing company, and based upon the record that he had produced for me and the relationship that I had with them, they signed me to my first publishing deal and my first management deal which led to my first record deal with a gospel, uh, major gospel label called Sparrow. And, you know, by the summer of 1986, 87, something like that, I have to go back and look. Um, I had an album out on a major label in the gospel field that had five top two singles on the charts. So, you know, I found myself basically predominantly playing in churches. So, when I made the transition to go to Nashville and do country music, I had never really played in bars. I had never really played secular shows, you know, secular meaning sort of w without God, God in them. Although I don't really believe that that's true. I believe God, God is in all of a creativity, but, but, you know, for the purpose of uh, delineating, I had never really played shows that didn't involve gospel music really. And so, you know, I hadn't fronted, a, I hadn't fronted a band really ever, except a worship band at church. So I didn't have a lot of the things, and I didn't have the road that a lot of people have to get there. What I did have, and I think this was really instrumental, was I had thousands of hours of knowing what it was like to sit with an audience with just my guitar and a story and a good song. 
And it, as it turned out, almost every one of the uh, presentations that I made to record labels, I was able to, uh, you know, I don't want to say maneuver it, but I was able to request it and facilitate it in such a way that all of those showcases were me and my guitar and the story. And, and so that was for a place where I was really comfortable and I was really good at it. And, you know, thousands of hours of speaking to people about things that are connected to their lives and their hearts and their sense of purpose and their sense of being, their well-being, and their spirit, if you will, um, wasn't just a trick that I had up my sleeve. It was truthfully the desire of my heart to reach people. And I think that somehow when, when I was given the opportunity to do that, even though it wasn't gospel music, people felt something. They felt my sincerity. They felt my, my connection to them. And it was coupled with the years of experience of knowing how to do that and facilitate it. And so, you know, that's certainly not a game plan that you would recommend to somebody growing up, you know, to say, here's how you get in the music business. But that's just how it unfolded for me. I know it's a long answer to your short question, but I mean, that's really how it happened. You know, it's really pretty darn cool, though, the way it happened for you, because from a guy that's done it the other way, the traditional way, we did do the bars. We did do the agent thing. We did do, you know, self-promotions and going on radio shows and promoting in, in, in advance and stuff, you know, and it takes a lot to do that. And the biggest issue that I have with it, and you touched on it, is that you, you've got to make a living along the way. And in the process of doing that, you're having to do what the club and bar owners want, and that is to provide covers. They want to so hear they're... music they've heard before. And of course, here we are with my second vocal show band, which that one ended up being the group that was really, I mean, we were offered a position or a, not a position, but an, an opportunity to be on a, a show with Dick Clark, you know, Dick Clark's production of the Captain and Tennille summer music series or whatever it was, something like that. And none yeah. of the networks picked it up, but that was going to be our big showcase when we were all so ready for that. But those opportunities, unless you've got the right agent or the right producer there knocking on the doors for you and making this happen, it's uh, it's so difficult. And you've got to be playing the covers. And I'm not saying that it wasn't a good experience for us. It, it was. But the way you did it, the path that you followed, my gosh, I mean, it's it's perfect because it has positivity, you know, through the whole thing. You're helping kids. You're you're doing what you want to do. You're writing your songs. You're performing your songs. You're you're happy with it. You're passionate with it. And it carries over. And obviously you've been doing it for 30 plus years. So how <laughs> exciting and how cool is that? You know, I mean Well, th thank you for celebrating and recognizing that with me. I, I really appreciate it. You know, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. And over the years, you know, on occasion I have a young person ask me, well, how did you make it? And what I've learned is what that's not really the question they're asking. What they're really asking, even though they haven't articulated it, is how am I going to make it? Yeah. Because the people generally don't ask that question unless, you know, as a young person, unless they really, that's what they're trying to find out. It's like, what did you do? Maybe I could do that too. And I just have come to the place where I say, you know, I can tell you what I did, but uh, we all have a different path. You know, and, and, you know, whatever I did isn't necessarily going to work for you, except this one thing. I had determination. I, I was completely determined to grow. My, my goal wasn't even like, let's get a record deal. I, in fact, I remember my first record deal I got with Sparrow. After I signed the contract, the president, <laughs> the president of the record label was a guy named Billy Ray Hearn. He was a t great guy. And, uh, and I signed it and I kind of, I guess he could see how excited I was. And he said, well, that was the easy part. And I remember, I remember, I don't think I said anything out loud, but I remember thinking to myself, are you kidding me? Do you know how hard it is to get a record deal? He said, well, that was the easy part. And I just thought, wow. And you know what? He was right. You know, keeping a record deal and being successful and selling records, that was the hard part. So 
um, I, I just, I say, you know, I don't know what you're going to do. I can tell you what I did, but, but you're not going to do what I did. You have to do it your way. And someday when you're successful, you'll tell somebody else, Hey, this is how I did it, but you got to find your own path. You know, that's, that's just how it unfolded for me. Exactly. And, you know, and you, you use the word determination, but it's, 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 it's got another element in there too, Michael, and that is the passion, the passion for what you do. And without that passion, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's the driving force. That's what keeps you um, happy. That's what helps you create the, well, the satisfaction of, of your, of your creative juices, you know, yeah. and, and, and having the opportunity to put them on vinyl or, 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 you know, or performing them. And, sure. and I guess that's, that leads me into the next part of what I was going to talk to you about. And that is the mere fact that over the last 30 plus years, you have performed over 2,500 times in what, 19 different countries. That's phenomenal. And you obviously, uh, had some great people behind you. I, I don't know if that was because of the time you were in the military that a lot of that happened. I, I'm going to assume that's probably what part of that was. You want to talk about that a little bit? Well, yeah, you know, I, when I sat down to figure out, because I, I wondered one day, I wonder how many performances I've done in my life. So I went on this journey to kind of figure that out. And when I first came up with the number, you know, 2,500 to 3,000, I thought, no, nah, that's way too many. Can't possibly be that. Because if I look at the amount of country concerts I was doing, it's like that doesn't add up to that. So where those numbers come from is when I was, you know, I told you when I left the church and I went to work for this youth group that was, you know, going out and doing assembly programs, we did, and I'm not exaggerating here, we did sometimes up to six programs a day. But usually it was four to five programs a day, five days a week a Wednesday night church service, and three Sunday services. And I did that 50 weeks a year, 40, 40 to 50 weeks a year for three years straight. I mean, that's where those numbers, that was my baptism in fire. Just over and over thousands of times being in front of audiences, you know. And then after I left that group and started my own thing, you know, that would have been from 88 to 96. So in the eight years that followed, I didn't do quite as many programs because I was out on my own. I wasn't with that group of guys anymore, but it wasn't much less. You know, I, I bet I was easily doing 200, 200 days a year, 250 a year, 20 programs a week. So and that's where those numbers got so gigantic, you know? So, uh, you know, in my country music career, I would say in the in the three years that I had a you know a major label, really vibrant hit records on the radio career, three to four years of that, we did I would say close to eight hundred shows. Okay. And on top of the shows, there was TV appearances, there was promotion appearances, there was radio visits. I mean, it was just go 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 go. So after I left that, um, and then started doing stuff with the military. Um, you know, I did a nine, 11, 11 trips to places like Iraq, Afghanistan, Korea, Germany. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I know in Iraq and Afghanistan, I did at least 150 performances. And these would be performances where in a day we'd be on a, a Black Hawk helicopter and we'd fly to four different places. And we'd get off, the chopper would land, we'd get off, and there might be 10 people at that performance. We'd set up a little PA, and I'd perform. Sure. Um, and then sometimes there was, you know, a thousand people there. You know, it just was really, uh, really diverse that way. So, you know, I suppose I've, I've done somewhere around 500 per presentations for military uh, audiences and, you know, veterans and military families over the years. I never served in the military. My wife did. She served 30 years, retired as a full colonel. But I mean, you know, that's, that's how you get to that amount of performances. It's just, you know, I remember after I left Sony, I, I had a, my second re record deal with Nashville was with Sony. And after I left Sony, I thought, well, you know, what should I do? 
And, and I just decided that whatever God brought my way, I was going to say yes. Because I, I had a feeling that the line, the line for people looking for a new contract and big money, that line probably was around the block. But the line looking for, for the line of people looking to serve others without any concern for the paycheck, but just to see how you could use your talents to serve others. I figured there wouldn't be very many people in that line. And I was right. And so, you know, my first couple of years after I left Sony and, you know, my gigs started drying up, the money started going down because I wasn't having hits on the radio. You know, I would bet 90% of what I did, I did for pro bono. People would pay my expenses, but I, I did it pro bono. And I'm, I learned a big lesson. I learned that it was a perfect way for people to experience your gift. Because many times, if, if you had to negotiate a certain price before you would go share your gift, you would never get the deal. But when you were available to serve people and work with people and truly, sincerely try to help them, number one, you always made friends. Number two, sometimes you made money. And in retrospect, number three, the three biggest financial deals that I ever did were all a result of me having gone and done something for somebody for free, which then later turned, hey, could we hire you to do this for us? I mean, the biggest checks I ever got from doing music came as a result of me serving for free. So it just, you know, there's, so there's, there's no shortage of people that, I, that need help that I thought I might be able to serve. And I, and I started to think of myself not just as a, a country songwriter or artist, I started to realize I was more than that, as we all are, you know, we're sure. all more than that. I was the writer. I, I, I could write, could write. I could help with branding. Um, I could be a communicator and a messaging person. And so I just embraced all of that because I figured, you know what? I love the music and, and I think people will love it too. But if I only give them one door to walk through to find me, that's not as effective as if they have, they could find me in a book. They could find me at a speaking event. They could find me at a school, right? You know, uh, so it just felt like it was a smarter idea to create a lot of opportunities for people to find me because essentially, in the end, I never was about just trying to sell music. I was always about trying to reach people. And honestly, if your music doesn't reach people, they won't buy it anyway. So the whole idea is to move people, to move their hearts. So I started my little company on the heels of, you know, being at Sony, I called it Moving People, which, you know, uh, not coincidentally is also my initials, MP. MP is Moving People. So that was where I felt I had a strength and something to offer. And over the course of those years, since I left my deal with Sony, you know, I've, I've made eight, maybe 10 more albums. Um, I've, I've had the most fun. I have more fun in the last 15 years than I had when I had my hits. I'm having more fun now. There's more joy, plenty of money, plenty of work. And, uh, and I feel like I'm doing something that matters. That's so fantastic. Well, you know, we've been talking a lot about how you got to where you're at. Now let's talk about some of the music because that to me is some of the most sure. exciting part of all of this. Yeah. Too good to be true. The first time I heard this song, first of all, me being a drummer, when I heard that beat to that song, I'm going, wow, this song is really grabbing my attention to have that yeah. kind of beat in a country song. Talk about that a little yeah. bit. Oh, absolutely. So uh, I had one of my mentors was a guy named Gene Pastilli. And if you look Gene Pastilli up on Google, you find it. Gene was one of the founding members of Manhattan Transfer. He produced Jim Croce. Uh, you know, he dated uh, Bette Midler for years wrote some of her big, big songs. Um, he, he wrote uh, he, uh, Sunday Will Never Be the Same for Spanky and Our Gang. He wrote two song for Randy Travis, which was, you know, ASCAP Song of the Year. I mean, this guy was, a, you know, a very successful songwriter. And he and I had become uh, really close friends. And we had started writing together and we had written together, I don't know, 13 or 14 times. And we had never hooked one but we liked each other's company. 
So, so he kept, because he was a big wig and I wasn't right. So he kept, he kept making space for me. We'd come and we'd hang out. A lot of times we wouldn't write at all. We just talk and laugh and, and uh, you know, kind of in the middle of all of that process, um, I was about to make my record for Warners. I got in a deal and I was at the gym and on the gym television in front of the treadmill, uh, MTV was playing and they were showing a video of this uh, hip hop band called, or this R&B hip hop band called a uh, uh, TLC. I don't know if you remember that, that band. And uh, I think they're, they're, the, they're the band that had this song Waterfalls mm -hmm. and, and a lot of other hits. So one of their hits was playing and there was this little loop that was going on in this production. And I thought, huh, I wonder what it would be like if you could write a country song against a hip hop group. Like, what would that, what would that be like? What would that result in? So that was where the idea was born. So I went back home and I pulled out my drum machine and I found a groove that I liked that I thought sounded like an R&B thing. And it could more of that slash hip hop soul R&B thing. So I went to Gino's for my next writing appointment. And I said, hey, I got this idea. What if we took like this groove, which is not a country groove, but we put against it, like let's not write an R&B song. Let's write a country song, a legit country song that could lay over the top of this groove in a way that would feel really organic. I said, let's try to do that. So off we went, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I've never done any research to prove this, but I think I'm right about this. The too good to be true, because now that, that's commonly done. The hip hop and the R&B grooves and the country music is commonly done. But I, I would venture to, to, to say that, that that song, Too Good to be True, was the first, the first country song that did that and was a hit on the radio. Now, I know Shania Twain had uh, a song that she put out that had a hip hop groove that hit the airwaves before mine did, right? But Too Good to Be True was the third single off that album. And I think uh, that hip hop song she had was either the first or second single off of her album. And so I, I you know, I think we, we might've been the first. In story. she ever wanted that was once upon a time she was all you ever needed that's what makes it such a crime how you took her heart for granted how you threw her love away now you still don't understand it if you did you'd never say it was too good to be true what did you expect a girl as good as her to do? What do you think would make that woman go find somebody new? She's not too good to be true. She's just too good to be true to you. So in 1990, I, I just made a commitment to myself that, you know, I guess whatever you were supposed to have, I didn't have it yet. So I decided I wouldn't go back to Nashville uh, until I had some kind of a green light in the universe, like something until the, something made it so clear to me that I was supposed to go back. I, I wouldn't go back until then. And I really buckled down on my songwriting for those three years. So in 1993, this song that I wrote, Taking Your Love for Granted, which had been sitting around for 10 years at that point, um and and i didn't even pitch it to them i yeah i didn't even know how they got it i just got a call one day from the publisher saying hey they've cut this song and for next thing i knew it was the first single and went to number one so i took that uh, as a green light that green light i said i've been looking for like i never had anything to walk in with to nashville with that said hey i've already been a success so now i had a number one song which it was gospel number one but nonetheless it was number one and at the same time, kind of around that time, two friends independent of each other took me to lunch and said, hey, how come you're not in Nashville? 
So I just felt, I just felt like the green lights were opening up for me to go. So right around that time, so I started going and kind of in that window, my first trip, uh, I met, you know, by fate or by chance, the executive vice president for uh, publishing at BMG in their gospel division. And he brought me into his office and after he saw me at a Shoney's for lunch. And he said, I don't want you to play me any music. I just have one question to ask you. Um, how often do you get to town? And I said, well, you know, I haven't been here in three years. And before that, I'd come five or six times. And he looked me in the eye and he said, you know, no one in this town is going to take you serious if you come once a year. You just have to come more, way more often than that. And then he said, before I kick you out of my office, I'm going to tell you that if you decide to come back on a more regular basis, I'll try to do what I can to help you. So I went home. Um, I looked at my frequent flyer miles I had saved up and said, I got to figure out a way to do this. So for the next three years, from 93 to 96, I went, I only missed one month, but I went a week a month to Nashville. Got a cheap hotel, a cheap rent a car, and hung out for a week at all the songwriter events and just met people. And I went a week a month for three years. And it was sort of towards the end of that, that I was, you know, back home in Seattle, I was walking through this little video store, you know, back when Blockbuster was a thing. And, uh, and I saw, I was looking, just, I thought, you know, song titles are song titles and you can't copyright a song title. So let me walk, let me walk through the library and see if I see something I think could be a good song title. And so I was walking through this VHS store and I saw this movie title from here to eternity. And I just wrote that down in my book. I thought, well, that'd be a interesting song title. You know, of course I didn't know that, you know, the theme song to the movie was from here to eternity and it had already been a big hit back in the, when the movie was a hit with Frank Sinatra. But I didn't know all that. I just put it in my notebook, you know? So fast forward, I don't know, a year and a half, two years, I'm in Nashville. Um, I've got Robert Ellis Oral is interested in me and, you know, it looks like I'm going to get a record deal. We're writing together. And, you know, every good songwriter, I think, shows up in appointments with ideas, you know, in a book where you go, I've, how about this? Or how about this? You know, how about that? So I said to Robert, because I had this idea on the way to the writing appointment, and I said to myself, what would it be? What would it be like? Because I've heard a lot of wedding songs, but I never heard a song that actually the guy that's popping the question could use to pop the question. Like if you could write a song that that guy could use, so he wouldn't have to say anything to the girl. All you'd have to do is have the ring in his hand and tell her, listen to this. And I just thought, what if that could, what if you could write a song that could speak on his behalf? And how cool would that be if it actually worked and people actually used it? So that, that was the nugget of the thought for it. And then I thought, well, I wonder what that song could be called. And then I thought of that title from here today. Well, what the heck? Why not? So Robert and I sat down and in a couple of writing appointments, we wrote the song and, and, you know, we liked it. Um, you know, you, that's why I say to this day, I don't know if you can write a hit song. I think you can write songs that are really compelling and engaging. Um, but the universe conspires and timing conspires to make it a hit. Exactly. And, uh, you know, at the time we wrote it, we liked it. We, we loved it. You know, like every great songwriter, what's your favorite song? Oh, well, the one I just wrote, <laughs> you know. Um, but, you know, then it came out. And, and I remember sitting with Dwayne Blackwell. Dwayne wrote, among other things, Friends in Low Places. Uh, Co-wrote that for, for Garth Brooks. And Dwayne and I were friends, and he was a mentor of mine. And after he listened to the album, this guy was a genius, man, a freaking genius. After he listened to the album before, before I think maybe Drink Swear had already come out, but Drink it turned come out yet. He listened to the whole album. I sat in his office. He listened, and when he got done listening, he pulled the album out. He looked at the back cover. He pointed it from here to eternity, and he said, "That's your biggest hit. That's your number one song." And he called it, man, because he was right. That was from here to eternity became the the only Billboard number one off that album. Um, even though to this day, Drinks for a Still and Lie has probably got more air, well, not probably, I know it does, has almost a million more airplays than from here to it does. But, um, you know, it's just, it was just a beautiful thing. And to watch literally thousands of people 
and receive letters and emails and phone calls. And, and to, for those two years that followed that hit that I was on the road a lot, every show we did, somebody proposed at one of my shows. You know, they, they, they came on stage and made a pr proposal. You know, it was just, it was just special, you know. Very cool. Well, you alluded to the next one that I was going to talk to you about, and that's Drink, Swear, Steal, and Lie. Uh, that definitely garnered some major attention on the same album uh, that year. So talk about that one a little bit too. Yeah. Dr Drinks Were Still and Lie uh, came about. Um, I was work. I, I, I moved to Nashville in August of 96. I had an offer from EMI, a publishing deal. I said, okay, I'd like to, do they hadn't signed the contract yet and so we moved our family from seattle to nashville and the second week or third week that i got to to nashville and was started to take a serious look at getting this contract signed so i could start making a, a draw from emi um the president of emi got uh fired and my attorney al schlesinger at the time um said to me you know I signed this contract now. And I said, why? And he said, well, because the person who really wanted to sign you isn't going to be there anymore. So you'll be somebody else's sign for the new guy. And he said, I'm just concerned that that's not a good, good long-term strategy for you. So um, if you don't have to take this deal, you might think about trying to find another deal. Well, I knew, I knew deals didn't grow on trees. It had been over 10 years since I'd had a deal, right? But something in my gut told me, he was right, but I needed a job. So I, I thought I need a job where I can still write songs during the day. So I need a nighttime job. So I got a job working at the BP on Bell Mead at a convenience store for $7.50 an hour. And I figured, you know, from midnight to 7 a.m. or 8 a.m., there'd probably be some windows in there where there's not a lot of people, and maybe I could work on songs during that. So it was in the middle of that that I got this idea. I was sitting watching one of the big gas tankers, you know, the oil tankers, filling up those gas tanks. And I thought to myself, I was sitting there, I had my guitar in my hand. So I'm, I'm the guy behind the cash register with a guitar in his hand at four in the morning, right? And, uh, and I'm playing this little kind of what feels like a bluegrass riff. But I don't really play bluegrass. I didn't really know bluegrass music very much. But I thought, huh, look how that feels. And while I was sitting there, I had this thought, what if you could take, well, actually, to step back a minute, years before that, I'd heard a great communicator, mentor friend of mine say that great communicators have a secret. I said, well, what's the secret? He said, the secret is they, they will take something that people know, and then they will show them something they didn't know about it. And that's a quick way to get into people's minds, take something they already know, and they told them something about it that they didn't know. And so I'd already been playing with like, how do you, how do you work that into songwriting? You know, how do you twist people's minds so that they go, I think it's this. Oh, no, it's that. So I thought, well, what if, what if you could take some cliches, country music cliches, and turn them inside out? Like people think it's this thing, but it's actually that thing. Right? And I'd seen a friend of mine had done that in a book. And I thought, I bet, I bet that could be a song. And so uh, I said, drink, swear, steal, and lie. Those are four things that you could turn into surprising people with the hook. Like, oh, that's what he meant. So that's really where that song started. And so I sat there, you know, for night after night after night, hammering out the first and second, first verse and chorus. And then I went and played it for my friend, Michael Purrier, who was the guy who was working at BMG, who told me if I'd come to the more often, he'd help me. And he, in fact, had helped me. Um, and I played it for him, and he said, well, why don't I hook you up with one of my writers? So he hooked me up with Paula Carpenter. And uh, in one session together, we finished up the song. I liked it. They liked it. I went and did a demo. So now I'm still working. I'm still working at the, at the BP. And I'm thinking to myself, huh, I heard about a guy friend of mine making $50 a song to go sing demos. I thought I could sing one song and make 50 bucks, which would take me eight hours working here. 
right? Maybe seven hours working here. And I thought maybe I could get a job as a, as a background or a, a, a background singer or a, a demo singer. So I had two demos I'd done at that point. One of them was first were still in line. And uh, I made an appointment with BMI. And I thought they're going to have to see me because I wrote this number one song for the Imperials. At least, at least, oh, excuse me, it was with, with ASCAP. So I went, went to make this point with ASCAP. And, uh, and I thought they're going to have to see me. So um, sure enough, they made an appointment for me with one of their A&R guys named uh, uh, Clay Bradley. And Clay Bradley was the grandson of uh, Owen Bradley and, and Harold Bradley's nephew. So, you know, produced Patsy Cline and all of that. So he, he came from a long line of country music royalty. So I walked in his office, we met, he said, what can I do for you? He said, well, I want to get some work as a demo singer. And he said, well, do you have anything I can hear your voice? So I played him, uh, what, what, uh, that's what they said about the Buffalo, the demo I had, and Drinks Were Still in Lie, both the demos. And he stopped during the first song halfway, and he said, is that you singing? I said, yeah. He said, who wrote the song? I said, I did. I was 12 when Daddy said to me, Take to drinking, boy, that road don't lead nowhere And don't you ever let me hear you swear Don't you dare He told me stealing is a lazy man's way Something for nothing leaves you held to pay So don't lie but Then you can look the whole world in the eye Honey, I try But since I met you, girl, I'm breaking every rule I must confess I'm just a backsliding fool I want to break from your loving cup Swear I'll we'll never give you a steal All your kisses underneath the moon I want to lie here close to you $50 a song gig turned into my music business career. You know, it's just, it's just, you know, you, you walk, you walk down the road the kind of the way you do if you're driving down a dirt road with no street lights and no full moon. And all you have is the headlights on your vehicle. You have just enough headlights to keep moving forward. And you just, you don't know what the, what's on the horizon. You don't know if your map is accurate. All you really have, is that 50 foot of headlight and and i moved through my life that way the way we all do i think on some level that's how we move through life i think we have illusions of knowing but i mean that's you know i just did the next right thing. and the next right thing was always driven by you know take a chance on your dreams because i knew i didn't want one of those jobs that was in the newspaper and that's how it turned out it's pretty cool man great story you know, fans and critics alike. I, I know I'm, I know I'm, I know I'm, I'm, well, I'm talking too much. I'm giving you away too much, but I mean, those are my stories from my heart, you know? Well, and that's what we want to hear, man. You know, uh, fans and critics alike uh, have named when the bartender cries as one of the country, country music, best country music songs ever that have mm -hmm. been, that's been written. Uh, that is a real, really cool video. I, I, I love that video. And I uh, talk about that one a little bit. Okay, so uh, at the time I got my deal with Warners and we we're working towards making the record. I was writing as much as I could. I, I think I wrote 70 songs in that year from when I got my deal. Uh, from the time I got my publishing deal to the time I got my record deal and kind of that few months that followed. So, I mean, I was working my tail off. And one of my co-writers was a, a woman named Hunter Davis. And I walked into a uh, writing appointment with Hunter at EMI, in the basement of EMI. And she had a, news, a New York Times uh, edition of the New York Times in her hand. And she said, hey, look at this. And it was a story in the New York Times about a bar that was being 
forced out of business because he lost his lease. And the, and the, the writer of the article uh, said even Nintendo was crying. And we, we looked at each other and chuckled like, well, you know, you know things are bad when the bartender cries because he hears everybody's sob stories. And the moment we said that, we both looked at each other like, oh, my goodness, did you hear what we just said? And so that was where that started. And uh, so this bar has been my home away from her. It used to be she was missing me. Now she's moving in with her best friend And I'm the only one who wants what used to be I'm here because today I lost it all I didn't want to drink it home alone but I just can't believe all my hopes and dreams are falling like a rope of dominoes. Well, I thought the man behind the bar had heard it all before. My story must have caught him by surprise. Cause when he handed me my double, there were tears in his eyes. You know you're in trouble when the bartender cries. He said last night you swore you'd never drink again. I said, next time I'm really gonna try. So if she ever calls for me, Oh, you can finally tell her he ain't here It won't be a lie I asked the man behind the bar What he'd been crying for He said that bottle used to be a friend of mine Now I've stopped drinking doubles But I pour them all of the time Son, you know you're in trouble And the bartender cries so I saw my own reflection Staring back at me not moon Every single word he said was true Well, I told the man behind the bar I thought I'd seen it all before Until I saw the sadness in his eyes That's when I put down my double And said my last goodbyes Cause you know you're in trouble When the bartender cries Oh, you know you're in trouble Bartender cries started. And uh, so we wrote, you know, the initial version of it. And and the, the chorus was identical every time. And it just kept bothering me because the first time that I would play it for people, they'd be like blown away, like, wow. But when we'd get to the second chorus, they didn't have the same response. And I just kept thinking, you know, it's sort of like a, a joke. Like if you tell the same joke to the same group of people two or three times, you just don't get the same response the second, third, and fourth time. Because they already know sort of into the punchline. So I thought, wait, well, you got to mix it up somehow. So here we were. I think we had a week left before we were going to go in the studio and make the record. 
And I just spent the entire week 24 seven trying to think how I could change the second and the third chorus. So they would still be similar enough to the first chorus that it wouldn't be like a shift, but it would move the story forward. And so I, I literally walked in the day that we were going to record and said, I've got a new lyric. Here it is. And, and, you know, I think that really, that was that little extra push that really made that song to a new level. And, you know, of all the songs that I've ever recorded that were released on major labels, you know, that's the song that seems to have the deepest, most personal impact on listeners. The letters I've gotten, I remember getting a letter one day from a woman uh, who sent me a letter and a key, a car key that was cut in half. So I'm like, well, this is interesting. What is this? So I wanted to read, the she said, this car key uh, was my husband's car key. And my husband was a severe alcoholic and almost killed himself several times driving. So I took away his car key and I cut it in half and I wore it around my neck on a necklace to remind my because he was an alcoholic. She said, my husband heard your song, you know you're in trouble when the bartender cries. And it so profoundly impacted his life that he, he got into AA and now he's been clean and sober for a year. She said, I'm sending you this key because I don't need to wear it anymore. Thank you for that song. That's great. That's yeah, great. So, I mean, it, 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 that's, those are the things that, like, you know, you can't, like I said, you can't really write a hit song. Just try to write a great song. And where they go and who they touch is we're really out of your hands, you know. And, and you can't take so much credit for it, but, but you sure can feel grateful for being the recipient of those gifts that, that the universe brings you know, you as a part of. Exactly. There, uh, when I saw the tribute to Glenn Campbell video, uh, when was that done, Michael? And what, what's the story behind that? How, yes. was it a whole okay. show of just you doing Glenn Campbell music or what was that? Well, uh, in 2016, I became the musical director for uh, a musical called Raiding the Country Vault. V-A-U-L-T. So there was a show in, in Las Vegas that was the number one show in, music show in Las Vegas called Reading the Rock Vault. And the whole premise behind the show was that it featured real rock stars playing the best set list of, of rock classics that you ever heard. So instead of being a cover band playing cover tunes, these were real rock stars playing the greatest set list of rock tunes you, you ever heard. So like the lead guitar player from Heart and just pe people like that. And so the guy that was the producer of that show um, and I became friends. And I said to him one day, have you ever thought about doing a country version of that show? So down that road we went and it resulted in me going and going to Nashville, to uh, Branson, Missouri. And I essentially, we replicated the same thing with a country show. So I hired the whole cast were all people that had either written songs or toured with hit artists and had a pedigree. These were all legit country music you know, a part of the country music family people. And uh, so, you know, we essentially did, it was what we called real country and real country stars. So there were real country stars in the show, people that had number one records. Then there was real country music. So real traditional country music. So that show, you know, was a, an hour and a half long show that became really as a, from a brand new show in Branston, by the end of the year, we were the number one concert show in Branson and for two years running on TripAdvisor. And that video is one of the songs that I sang in that show. It was a tribute to Glenn Campbell that I sang in that show. And so when I was you know, nearing my tenure there, the end of my tenure there, um, I made this record to celebrate my 20th anniversary in country music with 30, 37 records. And that was one of the songs we recorded. And so it was really kind of a, I was always a big Glenn Campbell fan, but singing that song hundreds of times night after night in front of audiences, really I connected to it deeply emotionally. And uh, that was what made me want to record, record it as a cover, as a tri my tribute to Glenn Campbell. Well, I'll tell you this, man, it's the best cover that I've ever heard of, of uh, Wichita Lineman. Um, oh, well, thanks. I did that, I did that song. I did that song with a guy by the name of Jeff Lynn Henson, who uh, was uh in our band for a brief period of time. He was out, out here, here at Fort Bliss in El Paso in the military. 
and he uh, he played with us off and on uh, for oh less than a year. But uh, he's he's quite a guy. He uh, he sounded a lot like Tom Jones when he sang, and he was a showman. He'd get out front and really turn it on with the women and everything, really good. And uh, in fact, his wife, uh, sh- her aunt is Florence Henderson, who just passed uh, away, you know, from the Brady okay. Bunch. But yeah. uh, but anyway, when I heard you do that, I'm going, wow, this this is this is the real thing. It really really sounded good. And, oh, uh, thanks. I appreciate that. I I know there's an old saying that says, "Whatever comes from the heart goes to the heart." And that song really came from my heart. So I think that's why it reaches people. Yes. Yes. And your musicians are just uh, first, first rate, you know, they were, they were really good. So, uh, well, my friend, I know you, well, you're welcome. And uh, I know you've got to get on with some other appointments that you've got going. So I'm going to, I want to do another show with you in the future. And I want to include your wife, Jill, with you on that show when we do it. And, uh, and, 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 uh, expound a little bit more about some other things that have happened in your life. And I think that'll be kind of a, kind of a neat thing to talk about. But in the, in the meanwhile, uh, I really appreciate you coming on here with me today, Michael, this has been really fun Thank you for having me. It, it's been a lot of fun and and you're the real deal, man. I really appreciate uh, your talent, your passion and, and, uh, just keep on doing it, man. Just keep on doing it. Cause uh, you've got an audience out there. You certainly have a, a fan in me now, you know, it's, it's really oh, been thank you, man. great getting to know you and uh, hopefully someday we can meet in person. You know, I've got some friends that live in Las Vegas and that'd be great. Hopefully next time I get over there, you know, uh, who knows when that'll be, but uh, we'll certainly look you up, you know? Oh man, I'd love that. That'd be great. Thank you for having me on the show. Appreciate your professionalism, your your passion, and your warmth. It really comes across. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Michael. We'll talk to you real soon. Okay, buddy? All right. Okay, man. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. I hope you all enjoyed this show as much as I did producing it. I think you'll agree with me that Michael Peterson is one of those special shining stars in the music industry. I want to end this show with the video we were talking about where he did the tribute to Glenn Campbell in Branson, Missouri. Enjoy Michael Peterson's Wichita Alignment. I am alignment for the county And I drive the main road Searching in the sun for another overload I hear you singing in the wire I can hear you through the wine And the Wichita line Is still on the line I know I need a small vacation But it don't look like a rain If it snows that stretch down south Won't ever stand the strain And I need you more than want you And I want you for all time And the Wichita lineman Is still on the line
And I need you more than I want you And I want you for all time And the Wichita line is still on the line 